All right, this is section 4.6. This is nothing new. All we're doing is taking the items that we learned in previous sections and putting them together to make a graph, okay? So let us um, sketch curves based off using rules for first derivative and second derivative and finding locations for maximum minimums of certain varieties and locations for concavity, where are we increasing and decreasing, where may a point of inflection occur, et cetera, okay? So I only have three functions that we're gonna graph. This is f of x. And um, while we only have three, that's very, very involved. And once we find all the little components and important pieces for making such a graph, um, such a sketch, we'll decide how we want to label our graph to the right here, and then we will do our best to sketch it out, okay? So here's what I wanna do first. I wanna start from the earlier sections, and I wanna find out where our graph is increasing and decreasing, and where may we find um, a uh, potential uh, relative max and mins, or maybe some absolute ones. Let's take a look. So um, I'm going to take the derivative in order to find extrema. This so is our derivative. I put the three times two there just because I almost forgot it. Okay, and then we're going to set this equal to zero to find out um, where some possible maximum and minimums may be. And then we can also talk about increasing and decreasing. So um, now when you do this, like let's factor this, uh, 2x can come out. And that will leave me with 2x minus 3, x squared minus 3. And then we'll see I set each one equal to zero. So 2x equals zero and 2x squared minus 3 equals zero. And so x equals zero for this, two x squared equals three. And if I solve this one on the right, and x squared is equal to three over two. And if I square root each side, I get plus or minus the square root of three over two. And note that that whole fraction is underneath the square root bar. I'm gonna leave it just like that. I'm not gonna simplify it because in calculus AP classes, you do not have to simplify. So let's just leave it as is. All right, now, from there, well, I'll write this over here. What I want to find out is, are these points, these critical values, are they maximums? Are they minimums? I don't know, we'll see. Okay. I know that all of these values, plus or minus three over two and zero, give me a zero for um, an input of x into your f of x function. And the reason why I know that is because that's how we found these by actually doing that solving procedure. Okay, so these are known. And what do I need to do? Well, I need to work around it. Okay, I need to find some values that are a little bit less than or in between these um, critical values. And we'll decide from there, once we input some values, um, what truly is going on. So uh, sometimes I start, start with the positive end here, just because I like positives. Uh, between zero and the square root of three over two, uh, that would be one, that's a good number. Something bigger than the square root of three over two, maybe two. And I could do the same thing uh, in the negative direction as well. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take these items and input them into f prime of x. All right. Now, if you like, okay, you can use your graphing calculator. And here's where I'm going to bounce around a little bit. Um, I'm going to escape this and keep my annotations, if you don't mind. And I'm going to go to my graphing calculator. Okay. Now here's what you'll notice, and you can hit pause on this video if you need to. Um, I put in the original function. I put in the derivative. And we haven't shown the math for this yet, but you'll notice on the bottom there is the second derivative, which we'll eventually use for concavity um, at a little bit later time. Okay, now if you think back, and I can't show you the whole PowerPoint screen, but just part of it. Um, I need to find these blue numbers, okay? Or sorry, these green numbers. I'm gonna input all of those into my derivative function. Okay, so negative two, negative one, one, and two. 
And to do this more quickly, since they're already stored in my Y1, you can see that over here. Sorry, not Y1, Y2. Um, here's what I'm gonna do to make this go fast. I'm gonna hit alpha and then the trace button. And I have the option to pick one of my um, equations from my equation editor. And notice that Y2 has the derivative function in it. So I'm gonna click on that. You can just hit the number two or scroll down. And then in parentheses, ah, darn it. Let me try again for me. Alpha trace. Scroll down. Sometimes I use my keyboard and it doesn't give me the, the right things. And um, I'm gonna plug in something smaller, like negative two. Now don't hit subtract two. Make sure it's this red negative sign. Hit the two, hit enter. And I'm hoping you can see that. It looks like it says that it is negative 20. All right, so um, I'm gonna mark that down um, on my sheet. And, and then I'm gonna repeat it for the other ones. And so now that you have this in your graphing calculator, you can do that as well. You may wanna hit pause just for a second and see if you can get those other items. And if you do that, then I'll do the same and we'll see what we got. All right, so I got negative 20 for this. And what else do I have? I have two negative two, positive 20. All right, and so what does that mean? Well, it means that x equals negative three over two um, provides some type of extrema, um, or at least a critical value where we have either a relative max or a relative min. And if you look at this, um, it looks like for your slopes, okay, these values for your slope function um, these values go from negative to positive. So negative values to positive values means that you have um, a relative min okay, at this location. At x equals zero, you have a relative, now you go from positive to negative, max, uh, relative max. And at x equals the square root of three over two, uh, you go from negative values to positive values for f prime of x. That is a relative min. Okay, and I could write this sentence in. I'll do one of them right now. Uh, at x equals negative three, we have relative min because this will bother me if it doesn't look perfect. Okay, because okay, f prime of x moves from negative to positive values. Okay, at x equals square root of three over two, and that being negative. All right, x over three over, uh, sorry, the one that's the square root of three over two, the positive version, is basically the same thing, okay? So this does the same. Okay, I think that's kind of a lazy move there, but there's so much writing just in this small screen that I'm gonna be lazy just in this case. And then for the max, you would say the same thing. You'd say, because f prime of x moves from, and then you say the reverse, from positive to negative values, um, at x equals zero, uh, therefore we must have a relative max, okay? All right, now the last thing I'm gonna do in this little part is I'm gonna write x, I'm gonna write f of x, and I wanna know the exact values for these respective minimums and respective maximum. Okay. And so when you plug in zero, you work it out, you get two. All right. Now, do I really want to take this and plug it into x to the fourth? No, that looks awful. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'll use my calculator. I'm going to cheat a little bit. Okay. So let me escape out of this PowerPoint just for a second. Now, remember 
that my equation, my original equation, this is what I want now, is stored in Y1. Okay, so I'm gonna quit this just for a second. And now I'm gonna do alpha trace. Y1. And in parentheses, okay, this is gonna look ugly, but it's the negative square root. So my square root button is behind the X squared. So second X squared. And in this item, I have the, the root, I have the square root of three over two. Okay, and what does it give me? Negative a quarter, okay. And here's the nice thing, you get second enter, second enter, and it gives you the same thing, but you're now allowed to scroll back and take away that negative sign just by hitting the word delete. Okay, and now you have the third item Okay, which is the positive version of the square root of three over two. And you notice you get the same thing. And the last thing, and I'm gonna do this a shortcut way, I'm just gonna hit second, enter, which is the previous command, if that makes sense. And I'm gonna clear this guy out, set a bunch of deletes, and then I'm gonna input zero. And you get two, I think most people could have done that in their head. So. Zero and then negative a quarter. All right, so let's go to my PowerPoint. All right, so here's x, here's f of x, negative a quarter, zero, and negative a quarter. And those are for these respective inputs. All right, now, big discussion. Let's graph this, and let's decide what we want to count by. And you'll notice I have quarters here, like 0.25, negative 0.25. Um, actually, they're both negative 0.25s. Let's count by 0.25s just to make this nicer for us. One, two, three, four. And I'm going to call this one, okay? And then negative one. That's a little better, two. Okay, this will be negative two and so on. I don't know if it goes too much deeper than that. Okay. And so at negative three over two, did I put a zero here? I'm sorry, I said two and two. There you go. Um, at negative square root of three over two, that's a, that's a little bit less than two. So maybe about here, I gotta go down a quarter. Okay. And I'm almost afraid to write these all in, um, but yeah, this is negative root three over two and negative 0.25. I don't think I'm gonna write them all in, okay? And the same thing goes over here. Uh, positive root three over two and negative 0.25 is about right here. Okay, and then I've got zero two. So if I'm counting my quarters, there's one, there's two, okay? All right, and because it's a quartic, I kind of have an idea of how it looks, but I definitely want to know some other things, like where might our concavity be? So, I'm gonna grab another color here, I'll use dark blue. Let's do the second derivative. And that'll give me, let's see, 12x squared minus, now uh, this was three times two, which is really six x. The derivative of six x is six. Okay. And like before, I will set this equal to zero. And right, we'll solve for x by adding six and dividing by 12. And if you square root both sides, you get the square root of one over two, but don't forget the plus minus. Okay. And what that means is I have two inflection points. P, let's write it up here. P O I. Yeah.
And my point of inflections are at x equals the square root of 1 over 2. I don't know the y yet. And negative root 1 over 2. Okay, so let's do this. Let me pick negative 1 over root 2, positive 1 over root 2. Um, I know those each give me a second uh, derivative of 0. And I'm just going to pick some items that are going to surround it. Okay, so let me pick something in between these two, like 0. It's kind of hard to read. Pick something else. That's purple. All right. Okay. And then something smaller than negative one over two square rooted. And that would be, man, maybe negative one would be okay. And positive one would be okay here. And I mean, you can use a graphing calculator. I haven't stored in Y3, but some of these are easier to just plug in by itself. Um, and I'll start with zero. 12 times zero squared. That part, that first whole term will give you zero. Minus six. Okay. And at negative one, you plug that in. Well, that negative will become a positive because that's being squared. So 12 minus 1 is 6. 1 gives you the same thing. Okay. And so what does that mean? Well, from where it's positive here, you're going to have concave up. Okay, And that is from negative infinity to negative 1 over 2, that part being square rooted. Okay, where is it concave down? Where right here you had negative slopes of the um, slope function. Okay, so um, what does that mean? Well, between these two, you are um, concave down. Okay, and then concave up again from 1 over 2 square rooted to infinity. Okay. And where are our point of inflections? This is the last piece. Okay, this is of course for your point of inflections. Well, I know they occur at negative one over root two, and the other one occurs at positive one over root two. And the only way that I want to do those is through my graphing calculator. Okay, and I gotta plug them into the original. And so if I go to my graphing calculator, um, they're in Y1. Okay, so all we have to do is alpha trace and the number one. And I will input the first equations, sorry, the first point of inflection, which is negative root three over two. Nope, sorry negative 1 over square root of 2. All right, and if you work that out, you get 0.75, okay? I'll let you know a little hint. If you do it again, okay, you're also going to get a, get a 0.75. Okay, if you do the positive version, and you do that real quickly. You just hit second enter and it gives you the same command. Backtrack. And you can just hit delete and the negative goes away. And you get the same thing. Okay. All right, so that helps us have a more defined location for our point of inflection. And so I think we said those were 0.75s. Okay, so I'm going to mark those in purple here. Um, this is still 1 over the square root of 2, somewhere between 0 and 1. And um, I'm going to go up 0.75, which, again, we're counting by units of 0.25, so that's easy to write. And then I'll do another one on this side. And I don't know what I decided to count by before. I think I'm just counting by 1s. 
that's fine. It'll be over here. Okay, so my purples are my point of inflections. Okay. And so let me just think about increasing and decreasing first. And I'm gonna draw some boundaries here, just real lightly, because I feel like this helps me understand this a little bit better. These are not asymptotes, I'm just trying to draw these in to help me define increasing and decreasing functions. Okay, and so here we go. Um, from, where are we at? Negative infinity to negative three halves. All right, did I not do this? I thought I plug these all in. Negative 22. I think you did maybe the first ones and then I said do the rest on your own. I forgot to have to do it. So, oh yeah, so negative infinity to negative root 3 over 2. Um, because you have a negative um, representation for your f prime of x in this area, that means you're going to decrease and that would make sense. And then from negative square to three over two, which is right here, to zero, you will increase. Now, remember at zero, it touches all the way up here at two. All right, so I'm still counting by ones with respect to the horizontal axis, but with respect to my x-axis, I'm counting by quarters. Now, you'll notice here that you have a change of inflection point. So um, let's take notice that our inflection points are, Let's see. Those are the actual values. Sorry, point of inflections are down here. Our um, concave up from negative uh, infinity to negative one root two. Okay, and so that's again concave up, and then it's concave down from negative one over root two to positive one over root two, and so concave down. You're gonna make us an unhappy face there. And that would be consistent because at this point here is going to be a relative maximum. You can see that uh, it's kind of like the halfway spot for our concavity. All right. And again, it's concave down from negative one over two to positive one over two square root of each. Um, here, this is a big important piece for um, where things increase and where things decrease. And so if we look at What's going on here uh, from negative root three over two square rooted to zero is supposed to increase. Okay, but then shortly after that, from zero to positive three over two, you have a negative value, so it should decrease. Okay, and it does so until you get to positive three over two, which is here. Now, the concavity at this point is going to change a little bit. Okay, so what happens? Down here, well, it will concave back up from one over root two square rooted to infinity. Okay, so that one over square root of two is right here. And you gotta go down, touch that last point, and go up forever in each direction. Okay, and it gives you a picture like that. If you want, you can check it. Do I wanna keep these? I do. Okay, and if I were to graph this here, I'll just do this off to the side. It says window, but I'm going to hit graph. And you can't see it all, so let me adjust my window. In fact, I'll just hit zoom six. Okay, and the blue one's the right one. The red one is the derivative, and the black one is the derivative of the red one. Okay, so bigger picture there, and we'll talk more about that another time and distinguishing which function is the original one versus ones that are the derivative and the second derivative. Okay. So, all right. Wow. That felt kind of enormous. The two that we have next, I think go a tiny bit quicker. Okay. At least the first one does. So here's what I'm going to do first. Maybe hit pause on your, um, your screen. I'm going to clear these out. And I'm going to write the new function that I'm using for my second question. 
And this will be x in parentheses squared minus 1. Okay. Close it, all divided by x. All right, I'm going to do a zoom. Uh, oh, six. All right, so you can see what it kind of looks like. You're like, wow, that looks kind of odd. But in the end, I shouldn't need to see this in order to um, do the math for it. So let's do this. Let's go back to our PowerPoint. I'm going to light this up here and make it full. And then I'm going to go down to the next screen. Oh, you know what? I didn't you the right picture. Sorry. I did. Okay, so um, new item um, is x squared minus one divided by x. And again, I'm just gonna check something real quick. x squared minus one divided by x. Now, we could take the derivative. Let's do the derivative first, and then we'll put the other items in. Okay, so let's take a look at g prime of x. Now, I'll be honest with you, I don't want to do quotient rule. I don't, okay? So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to write this another way. Um, this is really x squared divided by x minus one over x. And x squared over x is just x minus one over x. And if you want, because we're taking derivatives, make this look a little easier for yourself. Just make this x minus x to the negative one. You put that one there and just kind of internalize that and make sure that's the same thing. But it's kind of usual for us to move from this guy to this guy, but they are the same. Okay, now why do I want to do that? Well, it's easier to take derivatives with respect to powers. Okay, uh, g prime of x is x minus, well, actually it's not, let me take that away. All right, the derivative of x is one. And the derivative of the next piece, well, power rule says let's bring that down so that now becomes a negative one times that subtraction would really just give you a positive x to the negative two. Okay, now, typically I set this equal to zero and I'll see if there's any extrema. And if I solve for x, I would not get any real numbers, okay, so no real numbers. All right, what does that mean? Well, that was our first derivative. That means there's probably no max or no min. Okay, right? but let's, let's be sure. Um, remember though, when you look at your equation here, we have some restrictions. X cannot be zero. And even when you write it like this, it's the same as one over X squared. And so still X cannot be zero. And so, when x equals zero, g of x is undefined. Okay, so that'll have to be my critical value for x and f prime of x. So if I'm not talking about f, I'm talking about g's. All right, so zero. When I input zero into my derivative function, I get undefined, that's okay. We need both of those meaning we need our undefines and we actually need the roots that give those um, derivative zeros. And we'll just pick numbers on each side, like negative one and positive one. And I'll probably plug it into this one because I think it's easier. And bottom line is it doesn't matter if it's negative or positive, when you square it, it becomes positive. And I think you get two for each of those. Okay, what does that mean? Well, you're going from positive values to another positive value and it's completely undefined here, which means it's not continuous um, at zero, which suggests that um, it's not differentiable there. And um, you cannot also have a max or a min there, okay, because it's, there's no point that exists at zero. So um, all we know is that we are increasing. Okay, from negative infinity 
do two. And then we're, in, sorry, not two. Write these in terms of X, sorry. All right, so, sorry, negative infinity to zero. Okay, and it's also increasing from zero to infinity. Okay, so at zero, we got lots of important things going on. Okay, so there's my boundary for that. That's hard to draw on the tablet, sorry. Okay, but that's significant. It means no points will land on that or be part of that, um, that vertical line at zero. And it shouldn't cross it, okay? Which is basically the same thing. It should not intersect it. Almost like an asymptote. It is an asymptote. All right, let me get you a new pen color because yellow is hard to see. Purple. All right, so our second derivative test now. Um, normally, I plug in values for my f or my g. However, there's no extrema. There's no max or mins. Um, we do have an undefined at zero, but I don't want to plug it back into the original because I'll still get zero. And I'll do g prime of x, double prime of x. So here's the prime, here's the double prime. So the derivative of one is zero. Derivative of x to the negative two is negative two x to the negative three. Okay, and so it gives you this. Okay, um, I'm gonna remind you that we're always gonna kind of check things with the original, okay? Even though to solve, I'll divide. All right, and I get one over x cubed. Is there anything that you plug in for x so that in the end you could work this out and get zero? And the answer is no, okay? Nevertheless, I can still check concavity. Okay, so at zero, I know I get undefined. Okay, if I pick something smaller than that, like negative one, um, that will give me a negative. Let's see, actually I have to put it into the original. Let's be careful here. Negative two and then negative one, let me rewrite this. It is negative two over x cubed. This is my g double prime. Okay, and so what does that give me? Well, when you plug in negative one here, this bottom will give you a negative, and a negative divided by a negative is a positive. And when you plug in one, you get a negative two. Okay, so I can tell where it's concave up and down. It's concave up from negative infinity to this boundary of zero. And it's concave down from zero to infinity. All right, so again, zero is kind of this pivotal idea. And let's take a look at, see what it means, okay? Um, you're increasing from negative infinity to zero, so it's gotta go up and it must be concave up. So let's kind of pair these ideas together. It's increasing and concave up. Both of those are to the left side of zero. So increasing and concave up, I'm gonna guess it's gonna look something like this. All right, and it may not be perfect, but it's, it's probably something close. Okay, in fact, it may extend somewhere down here in the negatives. Well, we'll take a look in a second, okay. I could, I'm just going off a tangent here. Um, I could factor the top. Okay, and you can see that it must cross at negative one and one. Okay, so again, if you factor the top and set it equal to zero, that's what you get now. I'm going to adjust and delete this just for a second and put up my graphing calculator and just wonder if I get something close to that. So um, I'm going to just hit graph. Zoom six always gives me a nice square detail. Okay, so you can see it crosses through both negative one and one, but it's actually kind of sharp at first. It's kind of like a line y is equal to x to start with. 
And you may say to yourself, that kind of makes sense because as you cancel these, you finished with this. Notice I'm boxing it. You know what y equals x looks like. It looks something like this. And when x is a strong negative number, sorry, a strong number here, um, as it gets further and further away, it really just kind of makes it look like this. It'll get closer to zero, which means you just really depend on the x. So let me adjust this drawing to make it proper. If it lets me. Huh. Well, what do you know? Okay, let me just do it another color. If you don't mind. I do not want to start over. So um, I think it goes like this. Okay, so we'll ignore the purple line. And it kind of gives you almost a line like y equals x. Okay. And notice that it does increase from left to right, and it does concave up. It's kind of like the left half of, sorry, the right half of a happy face. The other part that you don't see looks like this. Okay, now the second part is concave down, so it must go down, okay? And you probably aren't gonna do this piece, but it's concave down on the other part. And so you'll get something that looks like that. Again, as you move closer to infinity, it should form y is equal to an x, which is a one. So not an easy derivative, but it had easier components to the very, um, the needs of extrema and concavity, and it, it was pretty smooth after that. So again, forgive me for this guy. That is not right. And I wish I could erase it. It may be solid, so no, it's still there. Okay, I guess I'll ignore that if you don't mind. All right, last one, obnoxious problem here. Um, and it's not that the derivative's hard, okay, but sometimes it's just hard working with pi over four, pi over three, and um, inputting them into the original and getting these kind of ugly numbers. So um, in any case, let's just begin like we have all, all the time. Um, let's take a derivative. And the derivative of negative x is negative one. Derivative of cosine is negative sine. Okay, now like before, let's set this equal to zero. Okay, and I'll add one to both sides. And divide by negative two. All right, using unit circle, and I'm one that likes to draw this out, we're gonna sign negative in quadrant three and quadrant four, sine is opposite over hypotenuse with respect to these angles at the origin. And these, of course, will be, if I think back to old school stuff, this is 30, 60, 90 triangles. Okay, so I know that each of these are 30 degrees. All right, and then I'm going to draw a reference angle, the create reference angles. The reference angle is just basically the angle made by the triangle that's close to the origin. So um, now we have to measure it from this part of my axis and move all the way around. So when you want the first one that finishes right here, that's an extra 30 degrees past a full line, which is 180. So you're looking at 210 degrees versus the finishing spot right here, which if you move all the way around, it's almost a circle, but you can't make it a circle because you're missing that 30 degrees. 360 minus 30 is 330. Okay. And I'm not gonna write these in this form. I just do it kind of to get my mind thinking the right way. But it's not really accepted in AP calculus. 210 degrees is seven pi over six, and 330 is 11 pi over six. And so those are the two roots, ooh, sorry, that we will work with, 7 pi over 6 and 11 pi over 6. 
And I got to think of some things that are either below it or above it, but I know that those each gave me zero. All right, so if I pick something just barely below this, I'll call that pi. Pi is just below it. Between these two, um, I can say 3 halves pi. And I think 2 pi should still work here. Okay, now, what are you going to plug it in? You plug it into this original. And if you want to use your graphing calculator, you can. Okay, you can go back and input the first derivative. Okay, then you can input the second derivative, put that in y2, one and y2, respectively. And if you want to take the derivative again, derivative of negative 1 is 0. Derivative of negative 2 sine x. Derivative of sine is cosine. Okay, we'll worry about the rest of this in a second. I just wanted to kind of get our mind thinking about that because we're going to have to address it soon. And we'll just plug some things in for x. So I'll start with pi. The sine of pi is 0. Think about what your sine curve looks like. It looks like this. And there's pi. So yeah, you got 0 here. Minus 1 is subtract 1. The sine of 3 pi over 2 is negative 1. And so that will work out to give you a positive one overall. And the sine of 2 pi is negative 1. All right. Oh, no. OK, so here is my x. Here is my, I don't know if I want to say that yet. Uh, I'm going to do that again. Let's, uh, let's decide where things are increasing and decreasing first. So um, if I look at this spot from anything lower than 7 pi over 6, I'll say from 0 to 7 pi over 6, okay, we, are, we are decreasing because that's a negative. Okay, and then here's what I'm going to do. 7 pi over 6, here's my graph. Okay, so let's make that 2 pi. I'm going to make this pi. And 7 pi over 6, well, pi is right here. 7 pi over 6 is just a little bit above it. Okay, so I'm just going to draw this little dotted line. Okay, and we'll identify some locations in a second and whether decide whether they increase or decrease. 11 pi over 6 is about over here. Okay, and what do we say? Well, because it's negative over here, that means it's decreasing. So you should have something decreasing over here. In this tiny little section between uh, 7 pi over 6 and 11 pi over 6, that's where things are positive. This is where it increases. All right, and then finally, um, anything past 11 pi over 6 is what you see here, and that is negative. So this is decreasing. Okay, now the only thing we have left to do is figure out in the places that it increases and decreases, what are your point of inflections? Okay, so here's what I got. I got h double prime of x equals negative 2 cosine x. And if I set that equal to 0, I get this. Keep in mind that we're going to use this for our testing values a little bit later. Um, if you divide by negative 2, you get 0 over there, and a cosine of x equals to here. And what would x make to be a true statement? Well, I think it is pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2. OK, so I'm going to put pi over 2 here, and that gives me a 0. 3 pi over 2 also gives me 0. All right, and so those are kind of our solid understoods, and we want to figure out what happens in between them. Okay. And so I'm going to pick some things that are in between those. And between pi over 2 and pi, 3 pi over 2, sorry, um, I'm just going to say that's pi. Got a little ahead of myself here.
Okay, so pi will go here. Something a little bit smaller than pi over two, we'll say pi over four. Something a little bit bigger than three pi over two is say seven pi over four. Okay, and if you go through and you can do this on a graphing calculator if you want, just put your second derivative in for like y2 or y3 and then input those values like we did before. That is certainly fine. And let's take a look here. Um, when I plug in pi over four for this guy, okay, that will give me rad two over two. And since it's already a negative two being multiplied by that type of factor in front, you'll finish with a negative two, negative root two. Okay, if you plug in pi, the cosine of pi is negative one at pi. Okay, so uh, negative two times negative one is two. And then finally, negative root, um, negative seven pi over four, we're gonna plug that in for our x, okay? And that gives you negative root two over two, which turns out to be a, sorry. Yeah, negative root two over two times another two will give you another positive, uh, negative root two. Sorry, didn't quite say that right. Cosine of seven pi over four, if you were to draw that, you're using this value, which is a positive over this hypotenuse. So that negative times the positive will give you a negative. All right, so pi over four, let me do this in a different color. Pi over four is right here. No, that's pi over pi, pi halves. Pi over four is actually right here. And three pi over two is right here. This is where I'm gonna have my point of inflections, okay? And you can see where my max and mins will be in terms of extrema. And we need actual values for our point of inflection. So here's what I'm gonna do. Last calculation. X that we had from our problem number three. Um, the X that we had for our second derivative we'll put here. Pi over two and three pi over two. And I just need the exact values that these correspond with. So when you plug in pi over two to this top, well, you get negative pi over two times two. And the cosine of pi over two is zero. All right, so. you end up with negative pi over two. Okay, so at pi over two, you have to go up negative pi over, or go down negative pi over two, which is, goodness, let's see. Negative pi over two, so a little bit more than one. All right, next piece, when you plug in three pi over two, Again, we'll plug it into this guy right here. Uh, work that out and we will finish with, okay, now cosine of three pi over two is zero. Okay, so you'll end up with negative three pi over two, okay times two, oh darn it. I didn't plug it in the original. I'll be all right. Negative three pi over two plus two, and it's the cosine of three pi over two. And again, this part will give you a zero, okay? So at three pi over two, which is right here, you end up with negative three pi over two. Okay, and that's a little, a little more ways down. Okay, now I think I'm still counting by ones, but I think when you plug that in, you get three times two, about four and a half. So something like that. Okay, and again, these are point of inflections. Okay. 
the increase and decrease, and again, your critical values were, um, it's like seven pi over six and 11 pi over six, which we've identified. All right, so what's our picture look like? Um, in the beginning, from negative infinity to pi over two, it is decreasing, okay, and it's concave down. All right, now from pi over two to three pi over two, um, it is concave up. Okay. However, um, it's still decreasing that area. It doesn't start increasing until you get to past seven pi over six, so. Uh, pi over two and negative pi over two. So I forgot to write that in. Pi over two, negative pi over two. There we go. I think I forgot to plug in. This is h double prime of x. I have one, two, three T charts, but I forgot to make one for my last one. Oh my goodness. Okay, so X and just X of X, H of X, and I'm gonna plug in seven pi over six. Sorry. And 11 pi over six. I don't see that anywhere. So I think I may have forgotten to put that in. Okay, and I need the exact values for that. So here's what you get. You get negative 5.397 for 7 pi over 6 and negative 4.027 for 11 pi over 6. So um, again, these are where our critical values are. All right, so at, we'll do this slowly to make sure we got it right. At seven pi over six, it should go down to negative 5.3. Seven pi over six is right here, um, negative 5.3. One, two, three, four, five, three, nine. Three right there. Okay. okay, so that was concave down. You're now concaving up until you get to here. You found this minimum, which is at seven pi over six, okay, just slightly past the pi. Okay, at this point here, um, this is a point of inflection, and it's at three pi over two. And um, that is, gives you a value of negative three pi over two, um, right here. And then at this point, you'll change concavities. And so this is concave up and anything past that is going to be concave down, okay? From this piece right here, because it is negative. And I think it gives you something like that. Okay. Now let's look back just to make sure. I don't want to start over, so we'll just adjust if we need to. I am going to keep that. And let's type this in real quick. Okay, so I've got negative x. and plus two cosine x. And if I hit zoom seven, okay, I'll get a picture like that and we'll have to change our window. And our window, if we go down a little bit more, um, I'll just go down to 10, How about negative 10.
and hit graph. Okay, it gives us something similar to what we had. Okay, it's important to note as we look at this last piece. Okay, that our 11 pi over 6 is where we had a relative maximum. And I kind of do that sketch kind of quick that 11 pi over 6, when I input it into here, it gave me about a negative 4.027. And I did that kind of close. One, two, three. Okay, probably doesn't go too much higher than that. Okay, I probably do that a little bit too sharp. Too high. Okay. All right, but there you go. I forgot to write this point in. My bad. So. Okay, that is sketching a function. I don't think they get harder than ones I did. Okay, nevertheless, give them a try. And there's not a ton of problems to do. There's just a few. And just because there's eight there doesn't mean that all eight involve all the components that we did. Maybe some of them will just be pieces of the work that we did. So give them a try. If you have some questions, let me know. Have a good day.